Alright, welcome back. This is turn 33 of Accidental Ascension as Late Age Atlantis. And 33 is going to be a sort of a, a turn where we stop and take stock of the situation. Um, because we've completed a war, because we're starting to hit research goals, because things are relatively stable, I thought it was time to take stock and plan our next sort of big move uh, and hopefully seize the initiative somewhere. Um, one of the things I did this turn was I actually uh, consulted with... Um, Lucid Tactics. Uh, I imagine if you're watching my channel, you're probably aware of Lucid's. Uh, and he did an intervention on this game. Um, I commissioned that because I thought it would be interesting to get a second person's opinion on uh, the strategy, in particular because Lucid and I seem to think very different uh, strategically. Lucid tends to prioritize threats for elimination uh, in games, uh, whereas I tend to I guess I have a more diplomatic frame of mind. I tend to view the game in terms of a series of relationships and the strategic element uh, overlays on top of that. Um, anyway, so around the time this video goes up, I'll tell Lucid that he can release that because he did a full a full series, a full video, uh, more than an hour analyzing the game position in the nation. A lot of that advice was uh, tactical, as in how to use Atlantis's tools to the greatest effect. Um, most of those were elements that I think I've discussed before, but I still. Um, recommend you go and watch that video but there are a few things that we're adapting from his from his recommendations that we'll be putting in here and that and that's one of the biggest reasons why I share game states and discuss with people because if you want to get better at the game um, there's the slow way which is you make mistakes try and analyze themselves and you learn and there's the fast way in which you make mistakes and you get other people to identify them and talk through those and then you analyze that advice and by cross-referencing what a bunch of people say uh, you hopefully become better at the game so, I'll summarise the, the turn as it is first, then we'll talk through some of that advice and what I'm accepting and what I'm rejecting from his recommendations. So, we received Earth Boots from Orm, which we traded for, very uh, important in getting us boosted up. Uh, we can make our own Earth Boots using that pair of Earth Boots. Um, we claimed the, the Brass Throne, which was cool. Uh, Pythium has put up Mother Oak. So, Pythium's just a little quiet power over here. Pythium has grabbed a couple of thrones, I think. One, I think they've grabbed one too. I'm not sure if that one is uh, Bulgarushan instead, but I think these are Pythian. One, two, three, four. And so Pythium has carved out a relatively large empire in this area between uh, Flegra, German, Ragas down here, Patala, Man. So Pythium is just quietly exploiting their decent research, and now they have Mother Oak, um, which is a great source of nature income for them. Um, and the first global enchantment of the game. So congratulations, Pythium. Um, we aren't really, we weren't really in the game to compete, mostly because we didn't have the nature gems to cast Mother Oak. We have the paths to cast it, but we don't have the gems. Uh, again, complete whiff. Oh, sorry, almost complete whiff on the site searching. We did in fact find a site in the Summerlands, but would you believe it? It's a bloody water site. It's a water site. That's ridiculous. Uh, my water income is ridiculous. My water stockpile is ridiculous. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, Arithia has proclaimed a new prophet. Uh, we found six blood slaves this turn. That's actually, by our standards, really good. Absolutely pathetic for 30s as a, as a blood nation. But we're not a blood nation. We're a non-blood nation that luckily got a couple. And you know what? We're slowly building up towards our goal of empowerment. Maybe I'll buy some... I think I will try and buy some Blood Slaves as well to accelerate our empowerment and get ourselves into the Blood Item trading game because if nothing else, we'll have good construction magic and Blood Nations often have terrible research and thus want to buy their boosters. Then we saw about a series of battles. Fukan, this is just raiding. Uh, look at this. This is a Bakabob. Uh, sorry, a Bakab out here and some camazots this is an interesting army of uh whatever you threw together but it has a reasonable number of mages for a pretty shitty like infantry i mean turtle warriors are crap but i guess it's free because it has to clear um there's some lake provinces over there battle in woodlands ah ouch yes okay i heard about this one so um gc underestimated the absurd amount of province defense that Erythia dumped in this province. And because they underestimated it, the uh, Bogorushian army, or rather this is a small fraction of the Bogorushian army, went in without significant mage support. Um, with mage support, this would have been easy to clear up. But as it is, um, the Malia Drugina come in and start doing the killing. One second, I'm just going to lower the game uh, volume because absolutely slaughtering me. 
All right, that's a little bit better. I may lower it further in the future. Anyway, but they then get distracted on these Makimos, and Makimos are like low-grade human light infantry, but they're enough to delay the Malia while at point-blank range you have Gastrophides and Crossbow Fire, and just like that, bang, bang. Because at close range, uh, Crossbows hit a lot more often. You get a shotgunning sort of effect, not in terms of multiple projectiles, but in terms of accuracy at close range. So the Malia Dragina uh, are slaughtered and rout, and that's most of the offensive power of the Bulgarusian army gone. They have a few of their own crossbows, but the Peshti aren't really anything to write home about. So even with the Bogatir boosting morale, uh, they're now going to lose this shootout, a few more infantry charge forward, and then the morale breaks. It's possible that if the heavy infantry had continued to press on against these um, Gastrophides wielders, they may have slaughtered them, but or if these guys had run out of ammunition, but these are also, they're 11 protection, they're okay crossbows. So, uh, ouch. That is an ouchie for the Bogorushian army. Um, losses, nothing like what I took last turn, because a lot of these units are cheaper and easier to replace and whatnot, but he didn't gain anything from it. I gained a capital from losing 110 really good units. He lost 65 eh, units, and 11 really good units uh, for nothing. So... I have no doubt he'll take the Woodlands with uh, Mage Support now, uh, but that still hurts. And what's this? Uh, Jabal was suiciding a madman into... Is this the... Yes, okay, so this is the primary... So the Necromancer controls two provinces, but we get to see, thanks to Jabalba, the main force of the Necromancer. So we've got a bunch of undead. We've got a series of whites. Whites are very... Whites are good. Whites have... 12-14 is good, Protection 19 is good, 23 magical damage with a decay effect, very good. Chill, so this should not be underestimated, particularly in cold weather, uh, that will fatigue out the people who it fights, so uh, whites, particularly in large groups, are very dangerous in that effect, and they're cold resistant. Um, and then what else we got? Okay, so this will be the Necromancer himself, I imagine. They're five with a bunch of gems. Okay. And then do we have a Bane Lord? Yes, we have a Bane Lord here, uh, but not geared. So, good stats. 42 hit points. Only size 3. Looks a bit bigger, but, you know, size 3. 20 protection. 33 damage Bane Blade. Um, these guys are all acting... No, I was thought they were acting as bodyguards for the White Mage, but they're not. Um... So that white mage will be able to very effectively uh, raise more undead to augment the undead they already have. So yeah, he'll be doing Horde of Skeletons. Yep. And I imagine that if you sent something that was big enough to tr trigger gem usage, then he'd start shitting out either a lot more skeletons or throwing Shadow Blasts or something. So, you know, not a bad little army there for the independents. Uh, unexpected events. Air gem plus three. Gold plus 184 and plus two luck. Cool. I'll take it. Uh, Necromancer has chucked the... Okay, so that means another... That means probably this province is now depopulated. Uh, it's only a, only a swamp, so... Not the worst thing for Flegra, who I assume originally owned this, but um, still, depopulation is depopulation. And then we kill two scouts. Smokey. Well, he was presumably watching the battle in Midgard there, and a Batab who is being used as a scout. Again, Midgard. So people were obviously spying on our war with Midgard to see what was going on, but they didn't move away after they saw the results. So there we are, and then we've killed some brigands. Uh, didn't renew the Fast Strikers, because their job was done the moment we took Midgard. And we got our national hero. Um, Sialuk is not great. Uh, he's just a Death 2 mage with 120 leadership and 60 undead leadership. So he's mostly just a free leader with a few death paths. I guess that's okay. He's a priest level 1, which is nothing good. Water 2, death 2, uh, sorry, death 2, water 1 makes him only slightly better than like your recruitable W1, D1 like lab monkeys. He's not good. He's not a good hero. He's not your good hero. He's the worst of your heroes in the Worthy Heroes mod. Um... All the other ones are more useful, but free high leadership unit, like, take it, and right now I'm just using him to research. Um, so that's what happened this turn. So that's clearly a sign that... Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Arithia's god apparently woke up, which is apparently... A, it's a, I remember showing it at the start of this game. It is a serpent of some kind, not a particularly dangerous one, um, but it woke up and besieged the fort. So GC will presumably... 
His troops are probably around here. They'll come back, they'll kill the god, or they'll push it off, and then they'll clear this province, and that will be Erythia dead, because Erythia no longer has their capital. Um, I'm pretty sure these are the only two provinces they have. Which is unfortunate for them, um, and also unfortunate for anyone who doesn't want Bogorus to, to grow larger. Bogorus is now probably... Bogorus or... Utgard competing in size. Orm is also pretty sizable. Flegra is powerful, but not huge, I think. Um, Jomen is relatively small. Abyssia is a middle power. I think Pythium's a sleeping giant. Uh, Patala's recovered. This game has lots of middle powers because there's been few, relatively few early decisive wars, so a lot of powers are in the middle. Um, we, as someone who have snagged some of some of an opponent and a second capital, are in probably the upper third. Um, yep. Yeah. So that's happening. The Flegra and Jabalban war is obviously continuing. It looks like Fleg uh, Jabalba has decent territorial holdings overall, but they've been pushed relatively close to their capital. Uh, Jabalba, for example, has a fort over here in Gintmark, but then again, this is their capital. So really. Shibolba's holdings over here are the more impressive component of their empire. Um, Flegra otherwise is pushing with tyrants, and this looks like the, Fleg the uh, Flegra and Field Army. So Iron Guards, Healed Archers, Crossbowmen, Shackle Mages, Move One Cataphracts. That, so that's, that looks like a Field Army, presumably for Siege Power, to augment the, the tyrants that are running around as sort of their main battle strength at the moment. So, what were, what were Lucid's reflections uh, operationally and strategically? Uh, let's cover what we are adopting operationally first, because they're irrelevant. Uh, it's, it's irrelevant what we do strategically as to how we overhaul our forces in that sense. Um, his number one recommendation was um, a constant refrain uh, of his in a point of conflict, is that I know that I stockpile gems way too much. I don't spend my gems until late game. As a result, I end up with these huge piles of them doing absolutely nothing for me. Um, and he and other people who I ask questions about that game inevitably tell me, spend your bloody gems and turn them into something useful. In this case, what we're buying is Siege Strength. We could have bought research items, but we're buying Siege Power. How do you buy Siege Power? You cast Reanimation with all your shitty Death 1 mages. So that costs 3 Death Gems, buys you 10 Siege Strength, which means you can buy, in my case, 100 Siege Strength at a time. This is considerably better than buying 1.4 Siege Strength for 39 resources and 16 gold. Not a bad exchange rate when you think about it. Um, when you think about it that way, it basically, yeah, it's it's just a quicker way to accumulate siege strength. If I could just recruit shitloads of infantry, like they were unlimited by um, resources and rec points, I would. But as it is, we're going to get a bunch of skeletons, and those skeletons are going to join our armies, sail with our armies because you get 60 undead leadership on on each Angakok, and you can imagine I will take a few with me if I go to war. Um, and Sialuk also has them, but he can't sail, so he'll probably get he'll pro he might stay behind if we depending on where we go to war. Um, and they can join our armies and help us crack forts quicker because quick wars are good wars, and broken forts are much easier to assault than forts that you can't storm um, for obvious reasons. So we're adopting that, um, and depending on who we fight, um, he's also done some talking about using um, turbo communions. Now this is something that I've been thinking about for a while. He just sort of expanded on the idea of using. Um, two slave, three master communions, because with a little bit of a boost, so anything that boosts the HP of Forgiving Fathers would get their regen rate up to three HP per turn, so we could do uh, Lizard Shaman, you could do a Lizard Shaman and two Forgiving Fathers with two Forgiving Fathers as slaves, um, they could have like Demon Banes or Coral Blades, and that'll give them three HP regen per turn, and then you can have a, um, a five mage communion with two slaves and two other casters. And those main casters can be throwing, um, can be at water three, um, or even water four if you send the water three randoms. And water four's casting, whoops, water four's casting, um, doo -doo -doo, where is it? There it is, Falling Frost. Water fours will cast Falling Frost at 18 damage, area of effect 6 for 10 fatigue. Which is nice, which is really good. Really, really good. Um, and if you're not using Water 3 randoms, you can get Water 2s, so you, everyone is, up to Water 3 to cast Falling Frost. And if you, you know, 
decide to make the regen more, then you can consequently increase the number of masters. Or you can accept some uh, that in most battles it'll be short and you can go four masters and uh, know that they're not completely unstable, but they'll take something like 26 rounds of casting to actually kill them from HP damage. So that's something that we'll definitely be doing. That and reanimation are two main switches. Other than that, we're gonna we we had most of his tactical ideas adopted already. So we're already building ourselves around wailing winds, uh, Stygian rains, um, and evocations behind an infantry blob. So uh, that's I'm relatively confident in how I'm handling the the tactical and operational elements of Atlantis. Uh, let's come to the strategic advice. So. The strategic advice um, Lucid has, because Lucid is a very pragmatic guy, is that, uh, so if all Menabissia go to war, as is likely going to be the case over Gath, I, I think that's more likely than not, uh, he wouldn't do what my instinct suggests, which is support my ally, because they're my ally. Um, he would leave them be, let them fight. He agrees with the wish that I should not go fight Jabalba because of the geographical elements that I outlined. He agrees with me that Utgard makes a, a nice northern neighbour and thus is not worthy of being knocked down, plus that they are, uh, they're someone we shouldn't fight. So Utgard is a good ally, he recognises. Um, and he suggests that we, as I mentioned, I think last episode, actually, um, maybe encourage them to cast Ill Winter at some point and don't attack them. Because people will attack them and also because Ill Winter benefits us greatly. Um, his recommendation instead is that we go attack Pratala. Um, I can't do that. I can't do that because we've signed sort of an alliance, an alliance relationship with Patala. And to me, that's where that... As long as... Yeah. I don't feel like I can attack Patala because of the diplomatic arrangements that we have in place with them. Um, so, I'm... I understand his strategic argument. I also... The two parts are, obviously, I can't attack them, and secondly, I think they're a much harder target than is assessed. I mean, the troops are terrible, but what Patala does have is masses and masses and masses of S1 mages for 40 gold. Uh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted statistics, pretenders, Patala. What Patala does have is... Not Brahmin, I want... Yogi, here we are. 55 gold, sorry. 55 gold for Astral 1. What this means is you can't take Astral to fight Patala because Patala, and they have reincarnation too, uh, Patala will just throw a bunch of magic jewel um, at you and kill all your Astral Mages and lose their Astral Mages in return. That's one thing they can do. Or they'll boost their Guru and their um, Naga Mages. And what their Naga Mages give them is Nature Astral. And Nature Astral means Foul Vapors. And without a counter to Foul Vapors, um, all my heavily armoured infantry would die. And without Astral, I can't get protection from nature. So, I don't like Patala as a target. Um, I still think my instinct is to wait to see where my allies go to war and pick one to support. Almost certainly going to support Orm, just because they're the much closer long-term ally, they've been in constant touch, etc. Um, is that strategically super sensible? Depends how you look at it. I think I think managing, I think projecting the image of being a reliable ally is important because it means that people are more likely to side with you even when it's against their interest. Some people don't see games in a reciprocal fashion. Um, I'm hoping that I'm dealing with people here who know if I make a strategically suboptimal choice in order to support them, that in the future they would make a strategically suboptimal choice to support me. Whether that's not attacking me when perhaps the hard numbers say they should, whether that's supporting me in a war that I'm not necessarily winning when backstabbing me is an option, because I, on the flip side, would not backstab them. Um, it's a very utopian view of what is essentially an anarchical geopolitical simulation. But so far, I've had good results with it. So we're going to see. For now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate um, forces in a variety of places. I'm going to move some men down here. I'm going to have some men in the capital. I'm going to move people to the coast here. So I'm going to create this three-point formation around the water so that I can respond in any direction at a moment's notice, essentially. 
I'm going to move an army into 108 because it's not doing anything in the capital here at the moment. And it's going to patrol for the Blood Hunter. This is that I'm moving in. Uh, that'll be Ingvar, and there's another Blood Hunter, oh, Anfar's down here searching with a few patrollers. Um, Zenantes is going to come is going to come up here and I think do some site searching. I'm going to experiment with blood site searching. Statistically, I'm not sure what the return is right, over just blood hunting, but I'd like some more passive income if I can. I'll look up the sites after this turn and see if it's worth it. Um, but my two other hunters now have sanguine dousing rods, which is good. And uh, Xenantes will move around, search a bit, and maybe come back to blood hunt some more. So that's all for now. It's turn 33. I'll be back in turn 34. All right, welcome back. We're in turn 34 now. Um, this is a probably going to be a relatively short episode because I'm recording it after the fact. I'm recording it at the same time as I'm recording 35 because uh, of the way things panned out this turn, I ended up not actually recording at the time. Just too much going on and didn't want to handle all the emergent elements in the game at the time. So let's talk through turn 34. Okay, so let's look at events list. Um, okay, uh, this is all just me casting reanimation. So we made 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. A nice round 100 skelly boys in the capital who I've equipped to two Unger Cock. These are, so Atlantis doesn't get national long dead. They get national soulless, but not national long dead. So maybe at some point in the future they'll fix that. But for the moment, you don't get shambler long dead. You only get shambler soulless, which unfortunately you do not get by reanimating. But that's 100 siege chaff. So that's great. Uh, we found, so we broke the magic site uh, drought, found three in Omia, Enchanted Tomb, Enchanted Tomb 2, and Wellspring. So two, death, and of course, we found more water. And then this champ over here found two death, one astral, one air. Increases turmoil, I don't care, four, na four gems. Four gems, man. So we increased our death income from 6 to 10 this turn, which is a quantum leap in our access to death magic over the longer term. Uh, we found exactly zero blood slaves. And there were some random events. Uh, unrest. 43 gold. Hooray! The day is saved. Uh, eight water gems. Uh, and then we just patrolled. Okay, so not huge on the events list. Uh, we finished construction 5. We're going to construction 6. Construction 6 will give us all the good thug gear that you could ever want. Plus, it gives us, uh, we can turn all of our fire gems into lightless lanterns, um, which will help get our research going. Our research is strong, but it could always be stronger. Um, and that is what I'm aiming for there. Um, battle wise, there was one, it was just a small, like, counter raid by Shibolba. And I just thought we'd take a quick moment to look at the Shibolban army. You can tell people have been in really big wars when they start throwing together the most like weird scratch forces of whatever they had handy. And turtle warriors, giant spiders, heavy cavalry, independent infantry, um, one mage up there. The Patab is presumably leading. Oh no, so the Bacab will be leading. And we've got like a, probably a water elemental Bacab at the back on conservative gem usage. Uh, yeah, so, okay. Giant spiders are terrible, by the way. But, like, who knows how he got them. Anyway, uh, he lost three giant spiders and two turtle warriors, killing 16 independent infantry. Um, but he seized this province. So, Jabalba's trying to stabilize the front line, protect the core of their empire. They've relinked to this fortress, which doesn't appear to be under siege at the moment. Um, but the tyrants will be out there somewhere. Uh, and when Flegra comes for an offensive, we'll see what happens there. So that's that's turn 34. What we're doing tactically and operationally, is not nothing, we're doing nothing tactically. Uh, what we're doing in terms of movements, I, su I should fairly say, is that we're centralizing. We're bringing our forces all towards our capital uh, to prepare for what may come next. Um, just uh, force concentration at this point. Uh, redeploying off these borders, although we'll reinforce these borders when we have a chance with Ulm and Jabalba, just to maintain forces in being, just we don't need to do so right this moment. So that's turn 34. We'll be right back with the more interesting turn 35 where I go over what's happening. Okay, it's turn 35. I didn't record last turn because I wanted to give myself time to think about what was happening before I made some decisions. So look, let's 
do events as normal and then talk about some rather large diplomatic developments. Okay, so events events list. Dwarven Hammer from Utgard. Uh, need more of them. Bandar Commander has claimed the Throne of Fortune. Now, I think that is this throne down here is most likely. Uh, and the Throne of Fortune is a, a good one. Two Astral Dominion gets luck, spreads Dominion too. Um, obviously, wouldn't be useful for lucky, lucky me. Um, but, you know, hey. Um, da, da, da. What else? Lady of the Crossroads. Throne of the Moon has been claimed. Should have checked them both at the same time. Throne of the Moon by Pythium. So Pythium, continuing their, you know, quiet way to the top. Two thrones, four ascension points. Um, a global, quiet research. No wars, no losses. Love it. Good, good, good times to be Pythium. Um, back to finding no magic sites. But you know what? That's fine because we found six... Six or seven magic gems last turn, so I'm okay with not finding anything this turn. And you know, four slaves and one fail blood hunt. I'll, yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. Five blood slaves a turn. Look, it's absolutely pathetic. But as I've said before, you're not a blood nation, and we only need a little bit of income here. May as well do it. And then there was a series of battles. So in Saren Forest, a Lace Dragonian tyrant came out and killed the PD. We'll look at him just really quickly to see what gear. So this is on the northern front. We're looking at, okay, Red Dragon, Anti-Magic, Might, Brand. Okay, so this is a non-regen construction. This is a probably low construction value tyrant. This is a construction value four. Limited path access giant. <clears throat> Surprised he hasn't got Rings of Regen, but, you know, 24 protection plus he can probably Iron Skin. Yes, he will Iron Skin. Come on, bang. 27 protection. There we are. Okay, so 27 protection goes up 4 when they berserk. Maybe you don't need... Against most foes, you don't need regeneration, so that's fine. Cool. Fukan. This looks like the Flagran main army. We'll look at that in a moment. And then another tyrant killing barbarians. How's this one geared? Dual wielding frost brands uh, and scale mail. So, this Flagran tyrant has two AoE attacks... Um, two Serpent Leg attacks, and then five Serpent Tress attacks. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine attacks of which two are AoE. That is a blender of a unit, an absolute blender. And again, the focus here has been on magic resistance, this time with both lead and anti-magic. MR22, probably pretty safe from most astral-based counters. Um, and also some blood counters. Um, but notably not break uh, break the soul, break the first soul, or break the second soul, I don't know. The one that causes bleed and doesn't have an MR check that Jabalba gets as a unique one, uh, as opposed to the normal bleed spell, which has an MR check. Unexpected events, death gems, prophecy income plus 20, and the necromancer has killed another province. Let's have a look over there. What's he killed? I don't know what he's killed. It doesn't look like he's expanded. I would have expected that meant he'd come up here, but maybe he's just continuing to life-suck the provinces he already has. Um, and we patrolled. Okay, so. I thought long and hard about this, but um, I think I've made a decision I'm going to stick with it. So, um, over to our east is the nation, in here somewhere, is the nation of man. Over here. Uh, so it goes Pythium... Then there's Raga somewhere in there. Uh, Pythium actually stretches a lot of that border, doesn't it? Anyway, um, Man is in there too. Man is in there too, and specifically Man borders Patala. So Man is hovering around here. Um, I think the Patalans own this province. So Man opened by declaring war on Raga. And Man was beating Raga really, really badly. Raga got pushed all the way back to their capital. Then man dropped the ball. They had some bad turns, and I think they staled like one or two turns too. Um, so Raga managed to start throwing them back. Now, Patala has a non-aggression pact with man. But seeing man start to fold quicker than expected to Raga, uh, Patala 
broke the non-aggression pact and attacked. Now, I kind of get the idea that if someone is, in particular if someone misses a, misses a turn or two, um, but there's going to be a sub for man that I get the idea that, oh, but I'm not going to follow an agreement with someone who's barely playing the game. I get that line of argumentation. I just don't personally buy it. And I find it, I'm now really paranoid because I have up to this point in this game hitched myself, like shared information with, allied with, and worked quite closely. And if you've watched my videos, you know I like to work quite closely with partners uh, and build up trust. And now the person who I've associated myself with pretty closely has demonstrated that they'll break a non-aggression pact. And more importantly, they'll break a non-aggression pact even though they know it's dodgy. Um, <clears throat> I'm not judging the Batalan player as a person so much, but more that their game player identity does not consider non-aggression packs to be sacred. If, some, if, for example, Abyssia started idling a bunch and I wanted to attack and I had a non-aggression pact with Abyssia, up until the point where they go AI, um, that is if there's any possibility that a substitute player comes in, and they should, and I would advocate for one, um, I would absolutely follow normal non-aggression pact countdown procedures. If someone went AI, I don't know. I think I'd gauge the, the mood of the room. And I know that puts me on the extreme end of the Dominion spectrum in terms of what I expect out of agreements and what I expect out of myself, but that's who I am and what I am. Uh, as a player, I want to build up new norms and ways of playing that depend more on um, the sort of cooperation and politicking that I'm used to in the other formats that I have played in and worked. Um, when I do crisis simulation competitions for um, military cadets and uh, postgrad students and that sort of stuff, those are usually won and lost not by their technical mastery of combat, although that can be really, really important, but usually by who maneuvers the politics and the negotiations better. Um, and I think that there's things that Dominion's players can pick up from that that might be useful. Anyway, the long and short of this is that I'm now in a situation where I can't, where I don't trust my partner anymore. Which leads me in a really unfortunate situation. If he's the sort of person who is willing to break a nap in order, in order to vulture, which is break a treaty for in-game advantage, if I then attack anyone else, then I have no assurance that he won't, if it's feasible for him, break the pact and attack me for in-game advantage. And given that Patala has 55 gold researchers, and given that Patala has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 forts that I can see, uh, which is comparable to my own, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and I may even have miscounted there and undercounted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, I'm correct. Nine, with ten on the way. Um, but I can't. I can't produce mages out of all these. I haven't templed or labbed this one, and I won't for a while. Um, so his mate. What I'm getting at is his mage production is at least equal to mine, and he can run a very econ economical research operation with very good late game astral boosted path access, while being able to deny his opponent's astral. Um, Leaving someone here who I can't trust is a really big no-no. Which leaves me in the complicated position of, well, okay, so I can't trust him anymore, but he was my closest ally, and also he's hard to fight, and there's a bunch of reasons I don't want to do it. But the reality of the situation was, at that point, as beneficial as it would be to get involved in a, a Olm Abyssia or Olm Bulgarusian war, which is what general confusion would have would really like me to do, I imagine. Um, uh, I'm sending a message to Patala cancelling our non-aggression pact. I'm doing this without telling Patala on Discord in advance of this message why I'm pissed, but the message explains why I'm pissed. The reason I'm not explaining anything on Discord beforehand is because I think that 
there's no reason for me to effectively undermine myself in this position by extending the duration of the nap by giving him artificially extra warning on Discord because our peace agreement requires that notice be given in game. So I'm giving the notice in game. As soon as he receives that, I fully expect him to start pulling forces from east to west. <clears throat> so I'm pulling forces from west to east. I am going to bring in a new group and reinforce that throne down there. Um, but for the moment, we're concentrating. We're bringing in a whole bunch of frogs and skeletons, and we're reanimating more, and we're reanimating some at the front line too, and we're going to concentrate on the Patalan border. We're going to do that with the view that the most likely scenario at this point is that we get into a fight. It's not a given, and I don't know how negotiations will go once I've made my opinions on this matter clear. But I also don't know how, no matter how those negotiations go, I can now evade the fundamental point, which is I now have evidence that Patala breaks non-aggression packs for in-game reasons. And while there may be caveats over the whys and hows, um, I'm not sure I'd be able to reclaim that confidence. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna preempt what those negotiations bring. Sorry if I'm somber, but it's not the way I like these things to go. I was enjoy I was enjoying working with the player for Patala Random Wolverine quite a lot. And I'm aware of the irony that uh, two turns ago Lucid was like, Oh, you need to go fight Patala and I'm like, No, 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 I can't fight Patala, blah blah blah. Diplomacy and good friend and then this happens. Um so uh not sure, does that make Lucid a genius or a fortune teller or just this just one of those random things that happens in life. Anyway, we're grouping up. We're going to build build up forces that we think can take on the Patalan challenge. Uh, we're going to race to get... Um, got a couple of things that we've got to do. We're going to go construction six uh, because I still need all that gear. We're going to get up to enchantment four, then enchantment five. But in between, we're going to take a stop and just pick up the last of evocation. Uh, Evocation will finally unlock Stygian Reigns. I saw no reason to pick it up before war. I'm setting it so we'll pick it up one turn in advance of when there can be any fighting. Uh, then we'll go Enchantment 5, um, <clears throat> which will give us Send Tupilak. Uh, Send Tupilak is handy for if he sends out um, expensive, expensive mages or anything like that. Uh, Tupilaks can kill a lot of them. And they can also annoy. They can also annoy stacks. So we'll definitely we'll unlock two blacks, and it's on the way to a bunch of stuff we need anyway. And then I will consider going. Um, what should I call it? I'll consider going Ench Seven for Serpent's Blessing because I'm very worried about foul vapors. Um, but we'll pick up before we get there. And I'm not sure actually about this. I might actually undo this. At the moment, I've got us going Evo 8 for Maelstrom, um, which will get a whole bunch of... It, this is a greed pick. I think what I'll probably do is I'll probably ditch Evo and go... I think I'll go Conj and Ench. And the reason I would do that is because... Okay, so let's 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 quickly wargame. How does, how does um, Patala beat me? Let's, let's get into his head. How does he beat me? Well... Okay, first thing he does is he um, he has some great threat vectors and some terrible threat vectors. His his great threat vectors are he has Mind Burn, Soul Slay, and Enslaved Mind. Cool, so he has the Astral Way of Killing Me, and he can Poison Me to Death, Foul Vapors. Uh, he can boost himself up to cast Serpent's Blessing and then cast Foul Vapors. So he is in a good spot there, or he can use an entirely Naga Force if he, if he really, really wants to, but he probably doesn't. Um... So he can poison me, or he can zap me. The way I, how do I deal with both of those? Well, I cast anti magic um, to counter the astral stuff, or I cast serpent blessing to deal with the foul vapors. Um, but I can't do either of those using communions, which is how I would normally deal with it. Like I communion up my my um, shamans because he can magic duel them with his 55 gold mages. And when he's paying 55 gold and reincarnates, and I'm paying 115 and don't reincarnate, that's a losing bloody proposition. And one of the many reasons I didn't want to fight this war in the first place. Still don't want to fight it. I feel compelled to fight it. Um, so, we need to unlock Serpent's Blessing, and I think we need to go conj uh, eventually and grab ourselves... Or have we already got it? Yeah, no, we've already got it already got contact Nyad. So we need to save up 50, 50 nature gems, 
we need to empower an Ungercock into nature and we need to make some naiads. Um, I'm not sure I'll get that done in time because it's a very expensive thing. I need to find the nature gems diplomatically in order to make this work. Um, <clears throat> and at the moment, nature gems are being bought up on the on the market really well. Um, the main producer is Pythium, and Pythium's already got pledged all of theirs in items or has sold them, which is unfortunate. Uh, we need the nature gems in order to get that. That'll cover off Surf and Blessing because Naiads don't have Astral. They cannot be magic dueled. They are homesick, so you need to rotate them home or regenerate them, which is annoying, but they're the only thing I can think of that will allow me to take an N3 caster with me on the run. Uh, the counter to the Soul Slay, I think, is we're just going to put up Wailing Winds and make his mages run away. He'll blow up the minds of a bunch of my frogs in that event, but I can use, so I'll be able to win battles and take ground while taking greater losses than he does, is basically the, the rhyme or reason of it. But if you take enough territory, you win anyway. And if I can force him into, force his back to the wall into a fort, then I'm in a good position. Anyway, I'm not worrying too much about the how at this point. That's just a bit of a macro discussion of Patala can kill me using Astral or they can kill me using Poison. They can't kill me using their troops. Like Bandar, Bandar Warriors against uh, Frogs? No. Frogs all win. They'll win bad. Troops are not my problem. I'm not worried about his troops killing me. I'm worried about his magic, because his magic is probably the best in the game. Uh, even including my own at this point, because he can scale his research so bloody well and has access to the right paths with astral boosts available. So, that's where we're at. We're sending a nap cancellation to Patala. We will inform... Um, all and uh, Bogorus, so they know what's happening, and they know why I'm doing what I'm doing, and why I'm unavailable. Um, and then we'll prepare to fight all... You don't always get to fight the wars that you want. You don't always get to fight your first preferences. Um, this is walking into a minefield. I mean, look at all these forts, and all those forts are spewing out astral mages, but I'm confident in the capabilities of the Atlantean military, I'm competent in the tools that we'll be bringing to it. And more importantly, I'm confident that I don't really have much of a choice. Um, if I want to make this front stable and safe again, I need to divvy them up. What I will definitely do is I'll tell Utgard I'm attacking. I'll tell Utgard I'm attacking and maybe uh, maybe he'll get greedy. The alternative is maybe Utgard attacks me, but I don't, I don't think he's got the stomach for that. Um, he might. It's a risk, but I'll tell Utgard. I'll tell Utgard that I'm going to... Um, may well be about to fall into a fight with uh, Patala, and we'll see what happens from there. So that was turn 35. Um, we've identified our next war target, apparently. Uh, we're forming up, and we'll see more military preparations in turn 36 and 37.